the beautiful images of projects, large and small, that you see in magazines and on websites like ours are in the main the work of a cadre of architectural photographers hired by AEC firms to call attention to new and renovated buildings or other structures. One of the stalwarts of that profession is Brad Feinkenop, principal photographer for the Columbus, Ohio-based studio Feinkenop, whose many awards include being a 2022 finalist for best photography project selected by Harvard University. Brad joins us today to discuss his art and trade. Welcome, Brad. Thank you. <laughs> Brad, let's start off by talking a little bit about um, uh, what the purpose of architectural photography is for clients. So, you know, what do clients need to determine before they decide to have their photo, their projects uh, shot? I think the, the main purpose is uh, for the purpose of going after other work, that if you're going to be hired or if somebody's looking to hire someone who's done a hospital, they want to see some of the hospitals you've done previously. So I think largely it's to show the work that you've done to express the quality of your work. Uh, that's probably the initial reason. The secondary reasons tend to be uh, pursuit of design awards or publication. Um, but I think it all is within the realm of, of marketing to be able to tell uh, a bit more or have somebody see images of the projects you've done here, there, and everywhere uh, when you're not going to be able to put a client into a plane and fly them all over the place <laughs> to see those projects in person. This episode of Horizon TV is sponsored by the Bilco Company, the industry leader in the design and manufacture of specialty access products. Bilco's automatic smoke vents protect property and aid firefighters in bringing a fire under control by removing smoke, heat, and gases from a burning building. Smoke vents increase the evacuation time and decrease the risk of smoke inhalation and damage while enhancing visibility to allow firefighters to quickly locate the fire. Smoke vents are ideally suited for large expanses of unobstructed space, such as factories, warehouses, auditoriums, and retail facilities. The product is fully insulated and gasketed for weather tightness and is constructed with corrosion-resistant materials to provide many years of trouble-free, dependable service. All Bilco automatic smoke vents feature the thermolatch positive hold release mechanism to ensure reliable vent operation when a fire occurs. Smoke vents are available with polycarbonate covers for natural daylighting and with acoustical sound ratings to block exterior noise from entering a building. Products are available in a number of UL-listed standard sizes. BIM models, CAD details, and three-part specifications can be found on their website to help with your next design project. Bilco's highly trained local sales representatives are always available to provide technical support. Um, when you get hired, do the clients generally have a good idea of what they want to have shot and their perspectives. Talk, let's talk a little bit about how a photo shoot is planned. Um, I, I think it, it sort of evolves. And I, I would say that when it comes to planning a photo shoot, it is important for the client to have a good idea of what they want, but maybe not down to the minutia. Um, it, it is... How I look at it is an architectural photographer wants to be treated with the same kind of respect that an architect wants to be treated with. Mm -hmm. If I come to an architect and I say, I want you to design this building for me, I I'm certainly gonna have a list of things that I want that building to comprise. But I'm also looking at them as a creative entity and I want them to bring their vision to that architectural project. I don't think architectural photographers are any different. And uh, there's a lot of times, and I, I hate to say this, this is very well-meaning on behalf of the architects. They'll send you a bunch of plans that have a little, little arrows in the corner, like take a <laughs> shot from here and take a <laughs> shot from there, and take a shot from there. And I will say more often than not, 
I, I don't want to say I totally disregard those, but until I'm in that space, see what the conditions are in the space and am able to kind of uh, determine what is going to make compositionally the best image, uh, you know, those little arrows or whatever don't mean a whole lot to me. Mm -hmm. So I think an architect needs to come to a project knowing that hey, we need to capture these spaces um, with certain design awards. They wanna make sure that you have shots of north, south, east and west of the building. And so you don't wanna be going after a, a design award and realize, oh, we never shot the north side of the building. Mm -hmm. So I do think knowing what you need um, and what you need to take away is important from the client but specifically how to approach each and every photograph, um, I think is less consequential. You need to have a little bit of trust in the person who's doing the work for you. Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, how long does it take you to be on site before you have a good handle on what you, what you want to shoot? Well, I, I will say that I, I know I have lots and lots of, contemporaries who are architectural photographers and we communicate and different photographers work differently. Um, certain photographers like to scout their projects, um, maybe a couple days in advance, spend a day there, really hone out what their vision is. Um, I would say the way I, in which I work is much more reactionary, mm -hmm. that most of my work is really not even in the state of Ohio, it's all over the country. So more often than not, whether I'm driving or flying, I'm going to that project and I will typically get to that project sometime in the morning. I'll take an hour, maybe an hour and a half to walk the project and uh, see the various spaces that I'm gonna be photographing. And then I would say after that hour and a half, I have a pretty good idea in my mind's eye of what I wanna execute over the next day and a half, two days, three days. Mm -hmm. And then the next couple of days are a lot of, you know, uh, taking what I have in my mind and executing it on, in a, into a digital file. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it is a process. Um, and a lot of times I can sit down and just kind of say, okay, on Tuesday at two o'clock, we want to be here. Um, I will say we probably take anywhere from a half an hour to an hour per shot. Um, we tend to be very meticulous and there's a lot of um, maybe moving around or <laughs> removing gar garbage cans where necessary. <laughs> uh, but a lot of little tweaking that we do to take the image from being just an average image to a, a good or maybe even a great image. Um, so, I mean, in a day of time, I may be shooting 12, if we're shooting X tiers, which you can sometimes move a little more quickly, 15 shots in a day, but about somewhere in the 12 to 15 shot range is about how quickly we work. Mm -hmm. Are there certain buildings that lend themselves to being photographed more than others? I mean, uh, is, is there, have you found that some are just easier to do or some are really more difficult to do? Um, this may sound like a funny answer to your question, but good buildings <laughs> um, that, you know, I, I have shot over my career, probably just about every type of building conceivable. Anything from arenas and stadiums to hospitals, to academic buildings, to museums, um, to bridges, on and on. Um, I'm, I'm very enthralled by the process. I'm very enthralled by working with the client um, my father and grandfather were both architects. Both my sons are on the road to architecture. Um, I was on the road to architecture myself until I picked up a camera at the encouragement of a lot of my friends who are photo majors. And so, and, and then that 
took me down another path, which I'm, I'm very happy about. Um, but I really enjoy the process of working with the architect, understanding their vision, then hopefully uh, being able to bring or uh, interpret their vision photographically in a way that will provide value for them way beyond when that building may even be gone. Mm -hmm. um, because I mean, I'm really creating um, these images that hopefully for a firm, at least in their marketing may last five or 10 years, but you know, if it's great architecture, it could be in architecture books a hundred years from now. And, um, so, you know, you're really trying to create something special and that's what I go at it with every time. Um, I mean, I, I will say museums are always fun and academic buildings with students thriving in them are, are typically a little bit more enjoyable than the hospital. Uh, but I've also been in some really progressive hospitals that I walk in there and I see people doing things in a way architecturally that haven't been done before because I think we're growing and we're learning about different ways to, I mean, certainly we've learned a lot about different ways to approach the work environment now. Right. And, the, and, and also the home environment. And, and I don't, I think that's true of the healthcare environment. So I'm, I'm much more interested in how we are evolving architecturally than maybe what that specific building type is. Mm -hmm. Um, how has technology changed your approach to shooting buildings, if at all? Um, I mean, it, it's changed a great deal. I mean, it, it's um, for 17 years, I shot four by five film mm -hmm. and I still will allude to film a lot like the audio files refer to listening to vinyl that mm -hmm. I think film has a certain warmth and beauty to it that I miss. Um, that said, film had a lot of challenges to it that were much uh, better equipped to overcome with digital. Um, I mean, I spent a lot of time uh, on ladders up putting magenta gels into fluorescent lights uh, because they would read green on film. Yeah. Um, we can adapt for that. I, I really feel in the digital age, I'm much better able to capture what I have in my mind's eye than I may have been able to um, in the film days. Um, in the film days, you would have to do an awful lot of lighting to boost the interior bright enough to be able to compensate for the windows. And therefore, it often gave the interior a different look than what was intended by the lighting designer. Um, and digital, we can do a bracket and we can combine them and post and we can create something much closer to the what the eye sees. And I think that's a wonderful advancement. Um, but it does come with, you know, we're carrying where we're not carrying around as many lights. We're now carrying around computers and other things to, and uh, the tech side of it is is much much greater than it was. Um, do you do much with drones? Definitely. Um, I I give it to my associate Lauren Davis. She was a big one to say, "Hey, we got to get into drones," and we were um, certainly more at the front end. And drones have really, really improved over the last few years. And I will say, I find the drone work um, really important. Um, I used to go up about three or four times a year in a helicopter and helicopters aren't to go below 500 feet and drones aren't to go above 400 feet. Right. And I would say uh, with a drone for architecture, typically like 100 or 200 feet is almost an ideal vantage point for a lot of architecture. And the fact that 
and you could never get to 100 or 200 feet with a cherry picker. <laughs> yeah. And you never get that low with a helicopter. So I think it has allowed views and vantage points of some of the buildings that I've shot in ways that were never available 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I think drones have been incredibly valuable. Brad, I've been getting a lot of uh, uh, emails from people that have, say they have availability of video for their projects. Uh, sometimes even to tell a little story about the project, not just shooting the building itself. Mm -hmm. um, does your firm get into video in a big way? And how does it change your approach to a photo shoot when you're doing video as opposed to static shotting? We do some video. Um, we don't do extensive video. Some of it's drone video mm -hmm. uh, where you'll be far away and you'll, you'll come up on the building or you'll circle the building to show it from all different vantage points. Um, and there's some kind of, uh, there's a lot of times we'll set up a camera to shoot a static shot and then we will shoot 30 seconds of video from that location with that composition. Um, I do think that there's been some beauty in what has happened with architecture and architectural photography. If you go back 25 years, you saw lots of magazines that had empty buildings and the architect just wanted to show their design. But I think we've come to the reality that we build buildings for people. And so to show buildings without people utilizing them seems rather cold. And so I think in the last you know, 15 years, architectural photography has had people in it. And I think the next step is sort of showing video and people moving through it. Uh, I will be the first one to say that I got into photography to be a photographer. I didn't get into photography to be a videographer. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's lots of people who got into video because they wanted to be a videographer and there's lots of production houses out there doing video. So I, I will say that I do video as a complement to my architectural photography, but I would not in any way, shape or form try and sell myself as a videographer. That is not my, you know, I've worked very hard to be the best architectural photographer I can be. I'm also working hard to be a better videographer than I am, <laughs> but I would not say that, you know, that that is my forte. Okay. What continue to be the biggest challenges for your practice, as, you know, both professionally, artistically, and so forth? Um, I think a lot, the biggest challenge I think today is actually educating the client so that they can understand what is really good architectural photography as opposed to okay architectural photography. Um, everybody now has a phone in their pocket. And those phones are getting better and better and they take reasonable photographs. Um, and I think that there's also things like HDR, which is high dynamic range, which a lot of photographers utilize to meld a series of exposures into a final image, but many do it not very well. And, you know, to that point, just to interrupt you for a second, when I first came into the business uh, cover for, for the magazine that I work for right now, I, I thought that the a lot of the photography looked like renderings, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, uh, and I was I was saying I, I had to ask sometimes whether or not this was a real shot or not. I think to, to, to the point that you're making, sometimes the, the, it, it's it's curated to an nth degree, if you would. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's very true. And I will tell you, I mean, just as I said about me and being a videographer, with the advent of Photoshop, I saw a lot of photographers who are spending 10 hours a week taking pictures and 30 hours a week in front of their computer doing Photoshop. Mm. I didn't get into photography to be in front of my computer. I got into photography to be behind the camera. So I spend 40 hours a week, probably more, <laughs> taking pictures. And I have a retoucher who spends 40 
hours a week retouching. And so I want to be the best photographer I can be and let him be the best retoucher he can be. And I feel that way, the end product is going to be better than somebody who's doing both of those things. Um, and, and, but I, I really do think that a lot of clients are just naive to what is good and what is really good. And what is the, what is, what are going to be the images that are going to win them awards if that is what their end goal is. And um, I think when you can really put a lot of architectural photography side by side, then it becomes a lot more discernible. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't give you the opportunity to talk about some of your favorite assignments. Can you uh, check, check off a couple of them? Um, you know, it, it's, um, as far as favorite assignments, I've been really blessed that I've had the opportunity to shoot a lot of great buildings. And I would say more than just the assignment itself, for me, it's as much about the relationship. There are a lot of clients who I've worked with for 10, 15, 20 years. And when I go to the location of a project that they've worked on for two, three, four years, and I connect with them, it's like connecting with old friends. And um, and I feel that my work is in many case, cases um, doing work for a friend uh, than doing work for a client. I've always described what we do um, as, as a collaboration, that it, it is people working together towards a common goal. So I really think it's about all the people who come together to make it happen. It's not my name may be on it, but it's not all about me. Um, so I, I will say that I have some really great clients that when we come together, we work on a project and get some magical results, that's, that's great. Um, and it makes it all the more special. The Harvard project, uh, which was done for Banish, um, the head of their uh, North American office is Matt Noblet. Matt and I have worked together for about 20 years. He's my friend. So when I go and I take pictures of a project and that project wins awards, whether it wins awards for me or not is kind of inconsequential. Whether it wins award for them, I've helped a friend get to another level or get a new client or get an award. And from that is where I derive my greatest pleasure. Brett, thanks for spending a couple of minutes with me to talk a lot about this. I've always find this fascinating. I like photography too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciate having this opportunity. It's been wonderful. And thanks to our audience for joining us. This is John Caulfield from Building Design and Construction.